and I hope all of you uh, uh, not only learn something, but uh, retain your motivation to do all the good work that's been gone before you. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Sarah. All right, thank you so much, Jim. We really appreciate you coming into our meeting this morning. Um, next, I'm going to hand it over to the Wildlife Diversity Program Manager, Melissa Pinella. Good morning, everybody. Let me just share my screen here with everyone. And let's see, I hit share screen, but I'm not sure if anybody can see my slides yet. Uh, we don't see your slides, now we do. Yep, we, your PowerPoint okay. is up now. Looks okay. good. Excellent, thank you. Well, yes, welcome to our 10th anniversary, anniversary of the Nebraska Natural Legacy Conference, a decade of connections on the landscape. Um, just really briefly getting you started. If folks are new to Zoom, um, we ask that you keep your mic muted um, while presentations are going on, and you can do that up top with the little blue boxes. Um, and then if you have questions, please type them into the chat. The chat is at the bottom of the screen. You'll find that there. Um, and then we will have discussion at the end of the uh, presentations for the plenary this morning. So at that time, you know, we'll answer questions through chat and, um, you know, we could potentially unmute to there depending on how many questions we get. So hopefully that all goes smoothly. This is the first time we offer this conference via Zoom. Um, given the situation, this was our best option. And like Jim said, you know, the great thing about this is we have a record number of attendees that are joining us during the course of the week. Um, the conference is all five days, various sessions. We know people have busy schedules. You can't make all of them, but we encourage you to get to as many as you can. There are so many wonderful talks on the program agenda. For those that uh, those presentations that you have to miss because of scheduling conflicts or if you have internet connectivity issues, we are recording those talks. And so any of the presenters that wish to share their presentations later, um, that will be available to you via recording. And we're figuring out the best way to share that. It might be on um, our website, it might be through YouTube, but you will have an opportunity to see those presentations since all will be recorded. So just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I started in the wildlife diversity program manager position uh, about a year and a half ago maybe a little longer than that, I kind of lose track of time sometimes. Um, but I've been with the Game and Parks Commission now going on 12 years and it's been a wonderful experience. I started there as a temp employee thinking I'd, you know, I moved from Ohio to Nebraska thinking I'd be here a couple years, gain some experience, do some good projects. And here I've made a life for myself in Nebraska, uh, live with my husband and two kids and our dog Coda, as you can see here in Lincoln, based at the Lincoln headquarters, um, working statewide. I don't get out much these days, but um, uh, great opportunities across the state for conservation. So give you an overview of the plenary this morning. I'm gonna give you some background, what the Natural Legacy Project is all about, who's been involved with that. You're gonna hear some examples of long-term projects that have taken place um, and really look how far we've come in the last decade. Now, the Natural Legacy Project has been around even longer than that. You heard Jim say the first edition of our statewide plan was 2005, um, but we started this conference. Um, the first one was actually 2011. So we'll look at some of those projects in our biologically unique landscapes. Um, we're going to have some special recognitions of people who are doing some great things and some awards. We'll talk about future opportunities, and there are still plenty of challenges out there that we're facing, um, and it takes a, a lot of dedication and hard work to take on those challenges. This is what our plan looks like, our State Wildlife Action Plan. It's a blueprint for conserving wildlife and their habitats. And really we wanna involve partners, individuals and communities and any conservation activities that folks take part in, those are all voluntary. And this plan really lays out the 
threats to our fish and wildlife species and, and plants and insects and comes up with conservation strategies, what we can do to address some of those threats. Um, it takes broad public input and participation. Every state wildlife action plan must follow guiding principles and there are criteria that have to be included before these plans can be approved. So each state independently comes up with their state wildlife action plan, and then it goes through an approval process with the Fish and Wildlife Service, and then we can begin implementing it. And how do we implement it? Obviously that takes money to do. Um, we are eligible with our approved plan to receive um, state wildlife grant funds. And then with those funds, we're required to have anywhere from 25% to 35% match, depending on the project. And that can come from a variety of sources. And we come up with that statewide match. Um, one of our sources for that in a, um, the organization that helps fund this conference every year is Nebraska Environmental Trust. So we're very grateful to them for that. Um, and also landowner contributions are a huge part of that match. It comes from many partner organizations to be able to fully use those state wildlife grant dollars. So we're conserving Nebraska's wonderful biodiversity. And obviously here, this is just a small snippet of the types of um, fish and wildlife and plants and freshwater mussels that you can find in our state. And if you really wanna see um, the results of a lot of these projects, um, there is, you know, we put together an NET final report um, and really to see how this is carried beyond the state of Nebraska and what other states are working on in their state wildlife action plans. There was just released a 20 year report on state and tribal wildlife grants. And so I encourage you to check that out sometime if you can to see what's going on in our region and across the country. And Sarah and I can send you that link if anyone is interested afterwards in accessing that report. So in Nebraska, we have a series of biologically unique landscapes, and those are indicated in green here on this map. And those little red dots, those are indicating natural legacy demonstration sites. A lot of those are on properties owned and managed by Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, but there are also some that are managed by other organizations, groups, um, and there are places you can go to see where people are really trying to make a difference on the landscape, improving habitats, um, and some great projects have happened over the years in those biologically unique landscapes or conservation opportunity areas. So to introduce you to who are the people working on the Natural Legacy Project, um, Carolyn Jazerski started in her position as Natural Heritage Program Manager last year, and she is also co-coordinator of the State Wildlife Action Plan. So Carolyn's job um, largely helps to coordinate a lot of the scientific efforts underway to make sure that we have a science-based plan um, going, you know, now and going forward into the future. And um, she has a wonderful staff, uh, natural heritage staff, and they just do a great job of really um, keeping all of that data organized, uh, getting projects going, uh, extremely important to our agency. We have Jerry Steinauer. Jerry is our botanist, and he's also part of this Natural Legacy Core team. And Jerry in these photos is doing what he does best, you know, often out in the field, um, identifying plants, uh, the unique biodiversity and natural communities, and teaching people about those as well. Um, Jerry often operates on a shoestring budget, unfortunately, so you could see it looks like down here in the the lower corner, he could use some uh, new equipment out in the field here to get the job done. Sarah Nevison started with us last year too. She's the moderator this morning that um, you've been hearing from and that gave you all these Zoom links and a nice organized agenda. She has just been incredible in uh, getting this Zoom conference organized. Again, it's the first time we do one like this. Um, she is holding a hawk here as part of a, 
uh, research project that she helped with um, in South Dakota. And Jen Corman, she is a coordinating wildlife biologist. Um, her focus area is mostly the middle and lower Niobrara biologically unique landscapes. She's employed by Northern Prairie's Land Trust. So again, the Natural Legacy Project really relies on these partnerships. And here I'm guessing she's probably looking for some American bearing beetle and a pit trap. That's one of the research projects that is supported by our state wildlife grants. We also have Krista Lang, who is a coordinating wildlife biologist. Um, she started, I think, out at Indian Cave several years ago and helping us control invasive garlic mustard and then has really just demonstrated how valuable she is to um, so many of the project needs and really has been continuing to work in Indian Cave Bluffs and also the Sandstone Prairies BULs. Um, and then helping with a lot of the work in the eastern part of the state. Chance Brueggemann, um, he is also working in that same general area mostly um, and working closely with Krista and really this team effort to make progress in improving habitat. We have Chris Wood. Chris is in the Ponca Bluffs Biologically Unique Landscape and he has done a lot of work at Ponca State Park, we have um, one of our, as one of our natural legacy demonstration sites. And so there have been just a number of projects going on up there and here he's leading um, a field tour. And Kent Pfeiffer oversees this staff for Nebraska. He's the, the man in the center teaching everybody on this uh, field tour. I think this might be one of Chris Helzer's photos from TNC. I, I was trying to find a good picture of Kent. You can't see his face, but it's demonstrating the great things that he does. And so he's a great leader of that staff at Northern Prairie's Land Trust. We have Kyle Schumacher in Verdigree, Basile, and um, Kippaha Biologically Unique Landscapes. And Kyle's just been getting so many projects going within the last year. He's been in his position now for the last couple of years. And we just um, hired, well, Burke Conservancy of the Rockies hired Chelsea Forehead in this partnership position with the Game and Parks Commission as a coordinating wildlife biologist. And she's gonna be working out in the Pine Ridge. This is only her second week on the job, um, but we're really excited to have Chelsea on board and to have her experience and um, her dedication to conservation in her new role. Andy Moore's been around for a long time and making great progress in the Les Canyons. Um, you're going to hear a lot more about uh, this morning during the plenary, you're going to hear a lot more about um, the Les Canyons and some of the work going on out there. And, and Andy's been a big part of that. And Ben Wheeler's a coordinating wildlife biologist focusing in the central, central Les Hills and Loop Rivers biologically unique landscapes. Uh, Ben's been around, I think, yeah, longer than any of the other coordinating wildlife biologists, really since the beginning of the legacy project, I think. Um, and you're going to get to hear from Ben during uh, the session this week. And he's got an interesting title, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say relating to prescribed fire. So really, it just it takes a, this huge team, a whole team, to make the Natural Legacy Project a success. We have the partnership team, which is about two dozen different organizations. Um, some of them are you know, government organizations, but non-governmental organizations as well. Um, and it's just great to have all of their involvement and input on the whole process. There's a science team, a wildlife education and recreation team. We have great support staff, um, our administrative assistants, you know, that help make all of this possible and other biologists, program managers, administrators at the Game and Parks Commission. Um, so even though they have a lot of responsibilities, they've all been contributing pieces to the Natural Legacy Project. And the commissioners are important, Nebraska master naturalists who give us the citizen science piece and the education piece to really get the message out there, landowner involvement, 
is, you know, Nebraska is so much privately owned, around 97% privately owned. And so we really need their involvement if we're gonna make a difference on the landscape. And then there's public input on this whole process um, when we are revising our state wildlife action plans and making uh, conservation a reality. So this morning, I want to recognize some uh, organizations and individuals, and I have to give a shout out to the Nebraska Environmental Trust. They have supported this conference the last 10 years. So even though when we're in person, we do have to charge a modest registration fee, NET makes up the difference of that cost because we're really getting that education message out there. Um, so this is for recognition of more than a decade of support of the Nebraska Natural Legacy Project, ensuring conservation of at-risk species and landscapes for future generations presented at this 10th annual Nebraska Natural Legacy Conference. So their support, again, has made so much of the work possible um, and, and just getting the environmental education uh, bringing groups together, making those connections. And this is, you know, our decade of connections on the landscape. So the signed version of the certificate, NET, I'm going to get that to um, Mark Broman. I'll get that to you in the near future um, when we can make arrangements. Now, we also, for the first time, are offering um, a Natural Legacy Education Award. And so, people nominated individuals that they thought showed any of these characteristics that you see on my screen. So they advanced or strengthened the field of environmental conservation education, engaged others in the Natural Legacy Project, uh, got people excited and inspired to participate, develop partnerships, or mentored and supported others in education. And so this individual didn't have to do all of these things. Um, you know, one or more of these categories would have been fine, but the person who was, well, multiple wonderful people were nominated, but the person who was selected really met every single one of these categories. So this morning, I am very pleased to announce that Dennis Ferraro is our recipient of the first ever Natural Legacy Education Award. Dennis works for the University of Nebraska in Lincoln and he's Professor of Conservation Biology and Herpetologist. Now, I have such a long nomination form explaining all of these wonderful things that Dennis has done over the years. I can't read it all to you, but I am going to go through some highlights. Um, he's been in his position with UNL since 2004 and uh, served as an extension educator and gone through a, a number of positions at UNL, very active undergraduate research lab. Um, he was co-founder of the Nebraska Matru Master Naturalist Program in 2005 and really helped to get that program going and secured funding for it. Um, he, his Master Naturalist you know, the program has trained at least 530 people. Um, they've logged 87,500 volunteer hours and conducted 8,000 projects and it had an impact value of well over $2 million. So really extending the uh, conservation reach through the things that he has done. Um, he makes regular appearances on Backyard Farmer television show, um, it was said of him by Dave Titterington, um, no one is born with a fear of reptiles. It is a learned behavior and snakes are most likely at the apex of that fear of reptiles. But Dennis Ferraro has a way through presentations and one-on-one -on -one interactions with children's and, children and adults to change these attitudes. You know, so he's reaching so many people and he's so enthusiastic about his work that is really um, impactful. And it, it helps maybe bring, not only change their attitude of, about animals they may have been uh, fearful of, but um, really can sometimes even pull them into changing the way they do things and becoming more engaged in conservation efforts. Um, he, in the past five years, he's trained over 300 Nebraska Master Naturalist volunteers um, it was said by, uh, let's see, 
Drew Tire. It's impossible to compete with Dennis. And I truly believe the man never sleeps. If he does, he sleeps, sleep works. We all know Dennis puts in well over 40 hours a week. And it, you know, part of it that is just his passion to really uh, get his message out there and reach so many people. Um, he's really become his own brand. And so people recognize his name and the wonderful things he does. So congratulations, Dennis. Uh, we're so grateful for all of your contributions to um, Natural Legacy Project and helping to meet our mission and you're gonna be receiving this Art Glass Award. And on the bottom, you can see it's gonna say, thank you for inspiring others through education to conserve at-risk amphibians and reptiles. So Dennis, we will get this to you soon. The Art Glass, you know, it kind of almost looks like some sort of species of reptile. Maybe you can help us identify that later. Now we have been um, giving away regularly Natural Legacy Conservation Awards. And so we're doing that again this year. And this is for an individual showing, you know, any outstanding projects, conservation activities, um, ecosystem-based approaches and partnerships and encouraging communication, education, a, a broader appreciation for Nebraska's at-risk species. And so this year for the conservation award, it is going to Lindsay Rogers. Congratulations, Lindsay. You are the recipient at the 10th conference Natural Legacy Conservation Award. Lindsay is our Fish and Wildlife Education Division Administrator for the Game and Parks Commission. And Lindsay has a way of really getting kids, adults, people of all ages, excited about Nebraska's biodiversity. And she created a wonderful um, biodiversity display that traveled all around our state. Um, and this was on exhibit in multiple nature centers. Um, it went to the Lincoln Children's Museum for a while. And so thousands of people saw this and were learning about Nebraska's biodiversity, maybe seeing images of species that they had never seen before. And so along with these images were a series of activities. And so this was Lindsay's brainchild that she really carried out from uh, beginning to you know, full implementation of the project. And Lindsay, the reason, yes, she has her history in environmental education, but we chose her for the conservation award this year the committee because um, she's setting a new precedent by we've got this uh, wildlife education division now. And so this is something new that can positive, positively impact and change outdoor education for generations to come. So it's pretty unique among um, fish and wildlife agencies to have their own division dedicated to um, education. So congratulations, Lindsay, we are so proud of you. And thank you for um, inspiring others for uh, Nebraska's conservation of at-risk species. This is your award. I realize I'm running out of time. Sarah's going to cut here. Um, anyway, lots of new opportunities coming up. You're going to hear from our plenary speakers. And if you have questions, this is how you reach us. And enjoy the conference, everybody. I'm going to turn it over to you, Sarah. Let me stop screen sharing. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, and thank you again to Director Douglas who had kicked us off this morning. Um, we really appreciate everything that Nebraska Environmental Trust has done. We're very excited to give them that award. Uh, congratulations to Dennis Ferraro and also to Lindsay Rogers, all very, very well deserved. Um, we are going to switch over now. We are going to have Sean Seville now um, present. So Sean, if you wanna to try to get your presentation up on our screen. Sean is the Alliance for Fish, for America's Fish and Wildlife Campaign Manager. And he works through the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. So this morning, Sean is going to give us um, a little bit more background on conservation funding legislation accomplishments and opportunities. So Sean, you should have access to be able to screen share and we would love to hear from you. Great, thank you so much. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, trying to 
get this up here. Let me know if you can see it. Yeah, we see your screen, but it's just not presented yet. Oh, and now we see your notes screen. Okay, I'll swap. Yeah, you never know which one's going to show up. Right. There we better? go. Yep, that looks good. There it is. All right. Thanks, John. Excellent. Thanks, Sarah and Melissa and Jim and the rest of the Nebraska Game of Parks folks. Nice to be here with you all virtually this morning. Um, I'm Sean Seville, the Alliance for America's Fish and Wildlife Campaign Manager for the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And I'm going to be talking to you about the progress to date on the Recovering America's Wildlife Act campaign and a couple of the other big uh, conservation priority pieces that have been moving and or passed recently uh, has been some exciting times for conservation legislation and we look forward to working with you all to advance uh, this big piece as well. Um, just by way of quick introduction of myself, uh, I am in addition to uh, running this campaign, um, also just a little background too, uh, prior to working for the association, I was the national field director at Audubon for 10 years. So ran a number of uh, policy initiatives working with states and other partners. So no stranger to working with state programs and state agencies and uh, federal folks and, and you know complex advocacy campaigns to advance these big conservation initiatives. So exciting times to, to work with you all. I'm also a proud new father for the second time. Uh, just as of about three weeks ago, we have a, a brand new baby boy. Uh, my wife and I are very lucky and uh, appreciative to have these two beautiful boys. Um, our our two-year-old has is, is really grown into his, his role as the big brother and the protector. Pretty cute to watch that. So if I stumble a little bit this morning or, or look a little sleep deprived, you'll, you'll know why. Um, but with that, let's get into the exciting progress on the Recovering America's Wildlife Act front. So hopefully folks saw uh, back in July, the big uh, you know, advancement of the legislation in the House. Uh, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act passed on the House floor as an amendment to HR2, which was the Moving Forward Act final vote of 233 to 188 on that final passage. This is a huge win for the coalition and for the campaign and you know, a huge you know, whirlwind of activity there. It really came uh, to, to fruition there in about six days from this, the process of drafting the amendment um, with Representative Dingle's staff to getting it bundled uh, and passed through Rules Committee getting it uh, through in the only bipartisan block of amendments that was considered for addition to that uh, HR2, the Moving Forward Act, and adopted by voice vote, uh, securing its inclusion in that final package and then passed ultimately on the, the House floor. Uh, as you can see from this picture here that was taken just moments before that final vote, uh, I was on vacation that week, or at least trying to be, and uh, you know, this is sort of a, a running inside joke with folks that, that are close to, to me on the campaign is every time I go on vacation or take personal time, something moves on the bill. I think uh, the birth of my first son was a house introduction of the first, first time around. Uh, every time I go somewhere or, or take some time off, uh, something big happens. So uh, people just look for those personal times on my calendar and, and know something big is gonna happen on the legislative front. So. But it was pretty cool to be there uh, with family and friends and be able to celebrate the passage of the, the bill through the house. Uh, and my two-year-old thought it was pretty cool that daddy was working to help save the bears and the, the fish they eat too. So uh, major milestone and accomplishment for the campaign there, obviously, uh, certainly not the, the final end all be all to the, to the bill and to the progress. Uh, we, we need to advance the bill through the Senate and then ultimately get it across the president's desk as well. But uh, the farthest that the bill has ever gotten through the legislative process. So very exciting there. And uh, sends a strong message to the Senate that the bipartisan support is there, that uh, there's enough support and congressional uh, sort of will to get this thing done. And, uh, you know, we're exploring Senate leads to hopefully get an introduction uh, before the end of the year of that Senate bill as well. So, uh, you know, we hope folks are taking opportunities to educate their 
senators and their Senate office staff as well. I know there's some good relationships there uh, and we'll look forward to, to working with you all to do that as well through the end of the year. Um, you know, we think given the, you know, sort of short runway and the, the you know, dwindling remaining legislative days uh, this year, our best bet may be to move the bill through the final infrastructure package that comes together uh, in the Senate uh, and or uh, an economic recovery package slash you know, stimulus. And I'm sure many folks have been tracking that progress. And, you know, there's been a lot of back and forth between House and Senate versions of the current economic stimulus package. But there still is a good opportunity, we feel, by the end of the year, maybe even in the lame duck session to move that, uh, including the Recovering America's Wildlife Act as a, as a component. So we'll continue to explore those opportunities uh, and let folks know as, as those opportunities emerge. Um, but, you know, we're really focusing on the positive economic impact of this legislation and the creation of up to 33,000 jobs annually uh, that the legislation would bring. So um, we look forward to, to working with folks on that. You know, the, the legislation in the House currently has 184 co-sponsors, just two added last week. We're looking to get up over 200 by the end of the year. Again, that sends a solid signal of support to both the House Speaker as well as to the Senate that the, you know, the legislation has the legs it needs to move across the finish line. So we're looking to get that done quickly as well. Uh, of course, your uh, very own Jeff Fortenberry is the lead Republican sponsor on the legislation. Uh, Mr. Fortenberry gave an eloquent speech in support of, of the bill um, during consideration of the Moving Forward Act uh, on the House floor. He loves to talk about the, the legislation, his partnership with Congresswoman Dingell, and how this would help wildlife in your state. And you know, big thanks to the agency and uh, folks that, that gave him the experience of going out on the Platte River uh, several years back and uh, seeing you know, some of your great conservation work on the ground and some of the projects that you're working on. He continues to love to tell this story uh, any chance he gets to uh, you know, regale folks with, with the great experience that he had with, with your staff out on the river. So um, you know, just testament to the, the work that you've done there with his office. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we'll continue to focus on the economic impact and, and real value jobs creation uh, of the bill. The, you know, it would benefit the nation's economy immensely by immediately creating thousands of new jobs. Uh, we think that's a huge benefit and a huge hook, something that has really led to a lot of the support that we're seeing, uh, supporting future economic growth in the outdoor recreation sector. Uh, through infrastructure improvements, uh, it would increase resiliency and recovery of imperiled species in their habitats and provide significant long-term savings to taxpayers by reducing future federal Endangered Species Act costs. So that you know, $1.4 billion investment from the Recovering America's Wildlife Act would lead to another over $3 billion worth of economic output uh, with that multiplier of 2.4, meaning that every federal dollar spent on species and habitat restoration would generate 2.4 times more money for the national economy. And that's a net positive gain of over $2 billion to the GDP. So, I mean, these are real numbers that we can point to and speak to the value uh, to the economy of this legislation. So, um, you know, folks are very familiar, obviously, with uh, Nebraska's uh, legacy project. And you know, there's a clear connection between the Recovering America's Wildlife Act and the, the Your State Wildlife Action Plan, of course. This would uh, allow for some great education and outreach potential and partner engagement, given the breadth of support in the state there uh, and the region for the great work that the Nebraska Game of Parks is leading um, with collaboration from many uh, on the National Legacy Project. So priority projects from Nebraska's State Wildlife Action Plan would be dramatically enhanced by this funding, and there are some great examples of the 735 species of greatest conservation need that uh, in Nebraska that would be helped by the passage of the bill. Uh, you know, some of those SGCNs include you know, river otters, the regal fritillary, the yeah, fritillary, I always mess that one up, fritillary butterfly, and the uh, whooping crane. So some of your iconic species that, that spend time and have, um, you know, key habitats there, are, are really you know, projects that we would like to highlight and the education work that we do. And I know 
uh, projects that you're intimately familiar with there that would be uh, dramatically enhanced by uh, funding through the Recovery America's Wildlife Act. Um, a couple of the other pieces that are moving as well that, that folks are have heard about, I'm sure uh, many of you watched the historic signing of the Great American Outdoors Act by President Trump on August 4th, uh, culmination of decades of work by many in the conservation community, uh, state agencies across the country and several administrations, uh, including members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. You know, this is a huge um, win for conservation, uh, which would give permanent funding to the Land and Water Conservation Fund at $900 million annually. It would uh, also give uh, $1.9 billion annually for five years to address the parks maintenance backlog. So uh, the passage of this bill you know, really demonstrates that bipartisan conservation is possible, that uh, if you put in the work, you can do you know, amazing, huge things like this and you know, makes the case for permanent dedicated funding as well and drives home the point that where there's a political will, you can certainly get big things like this done. You just gotta, gotta keep focused on the, the prize here. Um, you know, we think that this clears the deck for things like the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. And again, demonstrates to Congress that you know, the bipartisan support is there. If you get up close to 200 co-sponsors on a bill and you have the, that bipartisan support, you can really leverage some amazing things. So uh, allows for an opportunity to highlight the complementary nature uh, of the Recovering America's Wildlife Act with Land and Water Conservation Fund and with the parks piece as well. So, you know, these were, um, you know, not in competition with each other, uh, but rather very complementary. And uh, we'd like to see this get done as well. This is sort of being positioned as the third leg of the stool uh, for these big pieces. So, uh, you know, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act would fund proactive efforts led by the states, territories, and tribes to address the nation's looming fish and wildlife bi biodiversity crisis and to prevent species from becoming endangered. You know, some of the land protection funding in the Great American Outdoors Act will help conserve habitat. Uh, however, dedicated funding to monitor and restore fish and wildlife populations, manage existing habitat on public and private lands, and tackle emerging threats and diseases is essential to assuring quality outdoor experiences and maintaining the integrity of the outdoor recreation economy. So, you know, the chance to see and interact with fish and wildlife is one of the reasons that millions of Americans recreate in our public lands and visit our, our national parks from all over the world. So the bipartisan Recovering America's Wildlife Act will finish this job uh, started by the Great American Outdoors Act, uh, complementing new public land investments and benefiting all Americans. So this will again create hundreds of thousands of jobs, restoring our fish and wildlife uh, in lands and waters that we all depend on, uh, expand our outdoor recreation opportunities, and accelerate our nation's economic recovery from COVID-19. Another one of the big pieces that has been moving, uh, not quite across the finish line yet, but very close, is the America's Conservation Enhancement Act. Um, once enacted, this bill will reauthorize the North American Wetlands Conservation Act, NACA, uh, one of the great success stories uh, in this country for waterfowl, and uh, codify the National Fish Habitat Partnership as well, two of the most successful conservation efforts uh, in the nation, as well as reauthorize the Chesapeake Bay Program and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation as well. So in addition to other crucial provisions, it will establish a task force between state and federal authorities to address chronic wasting disease and ensure states have the authority to regulate types of fishing tackle based on localized uh, efforts as needed as well. So, you know, we're looking forward to seeing this get through. It's, it's um, passed House and Senate now, just awaiting uh, President's signature. So I wanted to highlight a couple things too. I'm sure folks are, are familiar with this piece. Uh, it was launched at the uh, AFWA annual meeting last year, uh, the, the 2019 State of the Birds report uh, really um, highlights the success of dedicated funding uh, and some of the pieces um, and it demonstrates the need for, for continued wildlife funding, highlights the states and their partners are the key to that successful recovery uh, of species that are in greatest need. So dedicated funding through uh, this Recovering America's Wildlife Act would be the solution to these, these uh, critical conservation efforts. 
Uh, it builds on the successes of partnerships like the joint ventures. Many of you are uh, in partnership with their the North American Bird Conservation Initiative and programs like the North American Wetlands Conservation Act uh, that clearly illustrated powerfully how waterfowl have thrived uh, and also provides examples of what can be done with dedicated funding. Um, there's a follow-up planned uh, later this fall in Cornell, in the Cornell Labs uh, fall issue of their Living Bird magazine featuring the Recovering America's Wildlife Act and continuing to echo the benefits to birds. So if folks haven't seen that, uh, please go to uh, stateofthebirds.org to check that out. It's really um, nicely done and a great graphic illustration of, of some of the success stories to date of programs like the State and Tribal Wildlife Grants Program, but also demonstrates the critical need for uh, more resources to get those big conservation projects done at landscape scale. Uh, just wanted to quickly go through some of the education and outreach work that we're doing uh, throughout the states. Um, we are working to um, raise some attention through this website here, recoverwildlife.com. Hopefully folks have been wearing their uh, Alliance t-shirts. Some of you may have gotten them uh, earlier this year at the uh, North American there in, in Omaha. And um, since that point, uh, we had you know, originally envisioned this being sort of a face-to-face -face, you know, festival kind of tabling experience and, and way to really raise some attention and um, some, some funding for the, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act campaign. But that was clearly um, you know, changed, our strategy changed with the whole pandemic outbreak. And uh, we've gone to an online um, sort of marketing and um, social media campaign now. So we're calling this the hashtag recover wildlife initiative. And it's really taken off, uh, gained a lot of steam. Nice to see folks, you know, out wearing their shirts uh, throughout the summer, sending back pictures of themselves and their family and their friends uh, doing, you know, socially distanced, responsible recreation activities. Uh, and we've been enjoying posting those on our social media channels uh, as well. So you know, this was really sort of aimed at the, the younger crowd, the audience that may really be interested in conservation initiatives, but has, had experienced some obstacles to getting engaged in some of these, you know, more sort of policy initiatives. So um, we found that it's, it's pretty popular with the, you know, the millennial type crowds and uh, the younger folks have, have really uh, taken this and, and run with it. So, you know, more and more people have obviously turned to nature and outdoor recreation to, to you know, socially distance and get out, uh, you know, sort of refuge from the stress of, of all this that's going on. Um, so this has been a, a great way to sort of highlight that uh, and also the, the great wildlife conservation work that's so important uh, to continue to, to help enjoy all these natural resources that we have uh, access to. So, uh, you know, we're hoping that folks will check out the website you know, buy a shirt, buy a face mask, help support the campaign, uh, take pictures of yourselves doing uh, whatever your favorite outdoor activities are, send them to us. We'd be happy to feature them uh, on our social channels. Um, it's a great opportunity to engage new audiences, uh, raise some awareness about the importance of the bill, and think creatively about how to um, reach new audiences and engage new folks. So um, check out that at recoverwildlife.com. It's also uh, available on the Our Nature USA site as well. Uh, speaking of responsible recreation, we've created some cool uh, social media content that, that we're constantly changing all the time. We've come up with some of the species of greatest conservation need and sort of done a, a fun little lighthearted riff on, you know, the wearing of the face mask and, um, you know, coming up with you know, sort of some lighthearted content like this. It goes a long way to engaging new audiences, uh, making people smile. And um, again, sort of looping back to the importance of getting outdoors and um, the focus on wildlife conservation as well. Keeping our public lands open during this pandemic by being responsible and following uh, guidelines. Hopefully folks have seen, you know, some of the content and the, the responsible recreation campaign that's happening too. I think uh, Nebraska's run some of that uh, content and has, has partnered up with um, you know, the association and some of the other partners that are working on this. Uh, we've been working with a number of states to, to really highlight 
some of the challenges that, that you're having out on the ground with regards to you know, overcrowding of areas or um, you know, wildlife conflict sort of areas or you know, in, now that it's hunting season two, um, making sure that folks are out being safe, wearing you know, orange, being visible, things like that. So we wanna really highlight some of the things that are challenges, but also some opportunities to work with states and um, you know, be a resource to you all in uh, you know, making sure that folks are promoting best practices, uh, getting out, enjoying nature and, and our outdoors, but uh, doing it in a way that's responsible. So you know, if you're interested in this, you can go to that website that's, that's listed there, responsible-recreation.org, uh, or the AFWA site as well. There's some content there. Um, we'll be doing a lot of social media engagement on this, uh, some photo contests later this fall, uh, and we also have sent um, signs out to states for you to use in your um, high recreation, high uh, volume recreation areas as well. So uh, it's got some guidelines there as well as some uh, resources, sort of links back to the Our Nature USA uh, site and the campaign as well to uh, support the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. And it includes some uh, links to actions that folks can take not only to support the legislation and the policy initiative, but also to do things like, you know, sign up to volunteer with your state agency um, or another local partner, support conservation by purchasing a hunting or fishing license or a habitat stamp uh, using native and wildlife friendly plantings, uh, things like that too. So check that out. And uh, we look forward to working with folks on that. Um, just some sort of quick next steps to, to wrap this up and, um, give you an idea of, of where we're headed. Uh, you know, we're going to need to to pull out all the stops to get Recovering America's Wildlife Act through this Congress. Uh, we really hope to, to do that. Uh, I think there are some opportunities, as I mentioned earlier, to get this done uh, this year. If not, you know, we'll hit the ground running early in 2021 in the next session and get it reintroduced. Uh, we're in this for the long haul and certainly not, not giving up anytime soon on getting this done. It's too important. Um, but, you know, thank you to everyone that has uh, contacted their elected officials, worked with partners to advocate for the legislation. Uh, we need to continue to demonstrate state support and um, you know, outreach to your delegations now to make sure folks are up to speed and, and aware of what's happening is, is great. Um, you know, as mentioned before, we're gonna continue to, to look for opportunities to include this in that final infrastructure package and or you know, economic stimulus bill that's coming together. It's a little fluid right now. We really don't know too much more on timing or uh, what that looks like, but you know, we're, we're there at the table. You know, we, we certainly will explore every opportunity to get that in. And um, you know, using that economic messaging that I spoke to earlier, I think is, is a really good solid way of, of framing this as in terms of um, you know, the restoration and resilience jobs that would be created by the bill. Uh, we want to get a Senate bill introduced as quickly as possible, too. We, we've had good conversations with several senators and their staff about the bill. Uh, no firm commitments yet, but we're certainly looking for that opportunity. You know, between now and the election, it's not, you know, nothing's really happening on Capitol Hill right now. But uh, shortly after uh, that election, we'll know sort of what the lay of the land looks like in the Senate and be able to explore more uh, Senate champions uh, at that point. So. Uh, we hope we'll, we'll be able to circle back with some good news on that front there uh, shortly after the election. And, um, you know, the, the su success of this really relies on all of us working together, you know, sort of talking off the same messaging points. We've got a, a bunch of materials that, that I can make available. I know there'll be some follow-up um, email and resources that, that I can uh, make sure that folks have those resources available. Uh, as, as people uh, share materials here, we've got some new talking points. Um, and you know, if we can work together to coordinate on messaging and, and demonstrate this broad support, uh, deliver that to, to Congress in a timely manner, you know, we'll certainly be successful in getting this thing done. So uh, your help in adding partners to the Alliance and um, making this appeal to your congressional delegation is, is super helpful. Um, and you know, we're, we're certainly gonna use the the opportunities available to us in this sort of virtual engagement space. It's really become the way of uh, getting things done these days. So, um, 
it's been a tough year. You know, we can certainly acknowledge the challenges, but look for those uh, opportunities to, to, you know, work towards positive change. And people are really looking for some good news, something positive to work on. And I think this provides a good opportunity to do that. Um, you know, also people are shopping online more than ever too, and looking for things that they can do that are sort of cause related. Uh, so if, if we can drive some traffic to that, our natureusa.com site and the recoverwildlife.com site, it'll give people some opportunities to participate in the campaign and, and do something positive with their time. So again, uh, resources are available. I'll be happy to make those uh, available on any follow-up uh, emails to, to send those materials, make sure that folks are are well aware of, of what's there for their, their use. And um, I will put up my contact information here as well. Uh, so folks have it, feel free to contact me anytime. If you have questions or, or follow up that, that you're looking at, you know, partners that you'd like to engage or questions about the legislative uh, campaign, feel free to let me know. Uh, and I will end uh, sharing there. And uh, I don't know if there's time for questions or if you're going to save that till the end, but uh, I'm, I'm available. All right. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, I have one question that has come in so far. If anybody else had questions for Sean about any of the legislation with Recovering America's Wildlife Act or with the Great American Outdoors Act, feel free to type them into the chat. Um, but the one that I did come in came in from Scott Ludke. He said, Sean, do congressionals understand the direct landowner benefits expected from RAWA, which is Recovering America's Wildlife Act, and the related private lands programs and that additional benefit? You know, that, that's a great question and I appreciate that. Uh, you know, certainly that's something that we have focused on. Um, and, you know, it's sort of the complementary nature again of the Great American Outdoors Act and the Recovering America's Wildlife Act one of the big benefits of uh, recovering is that uh, you can use that money to continue to uh, work with private landowners, and it would really, you know, go a lot towards, um, you know, the, those great cooperative conservation projects that uh, many of you are very familiar with, working with private landowners, uh, big ag users, things like that. It's not uh, limited to, uh, you know, sort of federal land acquisition, things like that. So. Um, it, it, it's something that we try to highlight with our outreach to congressional offices, something certainly that could be highlighted more, I think, to the extent that folks can give some specific examples of the work that the agency there has been doing with private landowners and other partners. Uh, those are the types of things, uh, especially if you can sort of roll in a, an economic value sort of piece to that. I think uh, those are the pieces that are really uh, influential with congressional offices. So uh, again, thanks for that question. And, um, you know, we do have some uh, sort of synopsis, sort of a compilation of some of those anecdotes that we can share. And if folks have other uh, good Nebraska specific examples, I'd be uh, happy to, to get those to, to highlight with our folks. Okay, um, we have had a few more come in. I think I'll ask you one question now, and then will you be able to stay with us till the end of our plenary session, Sean? Uh, I do actually have to jump off here in about a half hour uh, okay. for another call. Okay, um, so one of them said, do we know how our current senators would vote on RAWA? You know, so I think the, the bipartisan support is there. Uh, I think if we had to vote, you know, tomorrow, uh, it would be close, um, as most things are, but I think post-election, uh, things are going to be a little different. It's, uh, it's, it's challenging right now to get the, the two parties to work together on, on things uh, pre-election, uh, but I think that, that um, you know, spirit of cooperation is going to change a little bit more uh, once folks sort of know where, where we are uh, with elections in the Senate. Um, we, we do have, you know, strong support in the Senate and, you know, bipartisan support there. We've, again, spoken to a number of Senate offices, uh, including your, your two senators from Nebraska there. Uh, and I think the support is there. It's just a matter of continuing to do that education and, and really speak to the value uh, to the broader uh, economy and jobs creation and things like that that they're trying to achieve uh, with some of these um, stimulus and, and infrastructure packages. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, it looks like we have one last question, so I will go ahead and ask that so that uh, you can leave when you need to. 
It says, Sean, in light of the broad economic benefits, job growth, and support from the general population, what is the primary Republican objection to this? And I think he's well, referring to main, Yeah, the main thing that, that we've seen is the price tag, you know, and, and just the the fact that when you have a big um, congressional ask like this, it's $1.4 billion annually, it's, um, you, you have to come up with a pay for essentially, uh, an offset, if you will. And so, you know, in an attempt to balance the budget, uh, there are many of those that would say, well, you know, if you're gonna take $1.4 billion from somewhere, you gotta put it back in from somewhere else, right? So uh, I think in terms of, uh, coming up with that pay for, which, you know, again, the Great American Outdoors Act didn't have either, right? So it just, it goes to show you if there's the political will to get some something like this done and it benefits uh, a number of senators and their sort of, um, you know, pet projects and personal agendas, uh, you can get something done. Uh, it's just a matter of putting in the work to, to do that. I, I do think we'll continue to come up with ideas for uh, ways to balance that and to come up with pay fors and offsets if we can. Uh, but there, there's certainly good demonstrated examples of, of big pieces that have gone uh, without that offset piece. So I think that would be our, our the primary objection that we're seeing from some of the fiscal conservatives. But um, you know there are plenty that say, hey, look, this is important enough that we need to support this and, and make an investment. And the return on the investment is strong enough that we can make that case. Okay, thanks so much, Sean. Um, if any other questions come in, I'll try to get them to you. And maybe we'll try to be able to answer them. But looking at the time, we are going to go ahead and move on. So we are thanks now again. going to, yeah, thank you so much, Sean. Appreciate uh, it. We are going to jump into our decade of connections on the landscape roundtable conversations. So uh, this year is our 10th annual conference. So the theme of our conference is a decade of connections on the landscape. We have a really special plenary session set up for you guys. The presenters are gonna cover five unique facets of conservation or long-term projects that we have had in Nebraska. This will be a round table style session. Each person is going to have 10 minutes to highlight their long-term project or effort. And then we're going to have 30 minutes at the end of the session for uh, question and answers. So we definitely encourage you in the audience to ask the plenary panel questions. You can type those into the chat box as the presenters are speaking. So our five presenters today are Jerry Steinauer. He's the botanist and ecologist with Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. He is going to cover the Natural Legacy Project BULs, or Biologically Unique Landscapes. We then have Nicole Flectus and Sarah Hartzell, the Special Projects Administrator and the Park Planner for the City of Lincoln Parks and Recreation Department. They are going to cover the Prairie Corridor on Haynes Branch Project. Then we have Lindsay Rogers, the Education Division Administrator for Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. She's going to cover education and its important role in conservation. Then we have Jared Messel. He's a retired Missouri River Program Manager for Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And he's going to cover the aquatic side of legacy, highlighting some efforts on the Missouri River. And then we're going to wrap it up with TJ Walker. He is our Habitat Partners Section Assistant Division Administrator for Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And he's going to wrap it up for us talking about partnerships and driving home some of those successes of the legacy project. So we hope that you find this session and the rest of the 10th annual legacy conference engaging. Um, we hope where you can find where you fit into the legacy project and conservation in Nebraska and perhaps find a few new connections. So we are going to start it with Jerry. If you want to go ahead and share your screen, you are going to kick us off. All right, go to slideshow. Yeah, we can see your screen. There we go. Yep, looks like a slideshow. Thanks, Jerry. All right, good morning, everyone. Sarah asked that I say a few things about myself first. So 
I was born and raised in a little town of Millard before it was overrun by Omaha. Went to Wayne State and the University of South Dakota. Then I worked five years for the Nature Conservancy throughout the Great Plains doing things from plant surveys to helping manage preserves. And I've been with the, my present job for ever since. And I liked it so much, I never went anywhere else. So Sarah asked me to provide a tasty snippet of the benefits of conservation in BUL. So I promised her I won't talk for over an hour. Um, so I'm gonna talk about landscape level conservation, basically how and why BULs were identified and conservation in two examples of BULs. So a BUL are relatively intact native landscapes with native vegetation, prairies, woodlands, wetlands, or an area with an abundance of at-risk species. So the sand hills here is a great example of a, you know, almost total native vegetation. Some of BULs maybe have 50% of the landscape or less in native vegetation. We identified these 40 BULs in the first natural legacy project. Um, they were designed to identify a set of landscapes that offer the best opportunity to conserve bio, Nebraska's biodiversity. So if we worked in these 40 areas, that would give us our best chance. They were designed to drive landscape level conservation, force us to think big and think creatively. creatively. Ah, you know what I mean? Um, they were distributed in our four ecoregions, the short grass, the sand hills, mixed grass prairie, and tall grass prairie. We tried to include BULs that covered all 56 of our native plant community types for the state and as many rare species occurrences as possible. So the BULs along the lower Missouri and upper Missouri, such as Rulo Bluffs and Indian Caves, were designed to protect deciduous forests. The Wildcat Hills and Pine Ridge were designed to protect the pine forest ecosystem. The Rainwater Basin, great water bird area. That's why we picked it. What information did we use? Kind of three basic sources. We used our Nebraska Natural Heritage Program rare plant, our rare species and plant community data. You can see it shown here. You can see it's concentrated in certain areas. We used a lot of satellite imagery and aerial photos, you know, to pick the boundaries. Where did the grassland, where did the prairie boundary stop in a BUL? Where were the biggest wetland complexes in the sand hills or other region? So they came in very handy. I spent a lot of time looking at aerial imagery. Um, we have a lot of biologists who've been in the landscape a long time and we use their knowledge, you know, where are the best prairies in the Ponca Bluff BUL, et cetera. So we used our staff expertise and the expertise of other agencies to help refine this. Um, that was quick. Um, now I'm gonna look at the conservation of efforts that have gone in on in two BULs kind of distinct areas, the sandstone prairies in the east and the wildcat hills, BUL in the west. And I picked these two mainly because those are two areas I've worked a fair amount with the biologist and I'm pretty familiar with what's gone on in those BULs. Start with the sandstone prairies. You can see it, can you guys see my pointer? Right down here in the yep. Southeast, this little blob of prairies in this sea of, of agriculture, shallow, rocky sandstone, sandstone soils, very unique for the state. I'll just say it that the best conservationist in Nebraska has been poor soils, either rocky areas, low nutrient content, or very steep that have not been farmed. Um, it's mainly tall grass prairie and oak woodlands. 
it's mainly all private grazing lands. And so most of our conservation area, most of our conservation projects, we worked with private landowners doing projects on their lands. The threats there include lack of fire and like many areas of the state invasive species such as Caucasian blue stem, honey locust and cedars. So here's an aerial of the landscape. You can see the tall grass prairie on the shallow soil hilltops, the oak draws in the more mesic ravines. If you would have looked at this 20 years ago before we started, it would have had a lot more trees in the landscape. Um, you know, what can landscape level conservation do for us in that region? You know, it can help us protect area dependent species. There's prairie chickens down there, for example, you know, they need thousand acres, several thousand of an acres to maintain a local population. You know, if we worked on scattered prairies throughout eastern Nebraska, we probably wouldn't be doing much for prairie chicken conservation. We can maintain the genetic diversity and gene flow of local populations. This is a, the fame flower, a rare plant that occurs on those sandstone outcrops. If we can protect multiple populations in that landscape, you know, there might be gene flow between those populations. If one population blinks out, uh, might get restarted by seed from another protected population. And a big thing is we can do large scale management and get habitat heterogeneity. Um, landowners are burning down there. They're burning thousands of acres at a time in some cases. The different landowners have different grazing strategies. So we get a variety of different structure types that wildlife need. So you got a big landscape, you can get different management at a large scale, which is really valuable to a lot of lot wildlife and plants. In this BUL, most of the conservation, not all by for certain, but it, a big part is being done by the staff of the Northern Prairies Land Trust, uh, Kent Pfeiffer down here in the lower right, Krista Chance Brueggemann. This is after a big burn on private land. We were standing around drinking beverages and uh, enjoying snacks. Um, you know, Kent's been in that region for 14 years. That has allowed him to learn about the prairies, how they respond to fire, how they re how it responds to different grazing strategies. He knows the natural history of the landscape very intimately. It's that's critical for management. And what's really key, he's got to know and Chris and Chance also develop relationships and trust with landowners. You know, they know their needs from grazing perspective, economics. Um, they have developed the trust of owners like John Emick here who manages several thousand acres. And when you, when a landowner trusts you, he will work with you. He will buy into the programs that you are promoting. That is so key to Nebraska because we are a private land state. Um, you know, also key in this BUL has been the transfer of knowledge from the biology to the landowners. Kent has worked with these guys, taught them how to burn, the benefits of burning. John Emick and his neighbors get together and they burn hundreds of up to a couple thousand acres each year now. And that's all because we've had biologist working in that landscape. Those landowners are becoming the biologist. You know, the, the accomplishments over the last 15, 20 years, they've done 27,000 acres of private land projects, either tree thinning or burning, concentrated here in the yellow in these grassland parts of the BUL. We've worked with our WMA staff on 4,000 acres of WMAs, wildlife management areas, and SRA. So you can see the impact that concentrating in a BUL is having. So here's a shot of a big cedar cutting project. Um, 
dried cedar piles waiting to be burned. This area was pretty cedar covered. If you can go show this kind of positive large scale impact, you know, you go to the environmental trust or other funding sources and show them what you've done. They like that. They're going to give you money. So there's that component of VUL conservation. Moving on to the Wildcat Hills, these two- Jerry, you're at two minutes now too. I thought I got 12 minutes. Okay, um, Rocky Landscape, Western Nebraska. The threats are residential, ranchette and energy development, invasive plants. Here, conservation groups have bought large blocks of habitat. Gaiman Parks, Platte River Basins, um, TNC, thousands of acres. We have a nature center there, great for BUL conservation. A little plug for Preby, a private group that has the community trust, they raise their own money, they manage their own lands. Hod Cosman kind of runs the show, Bob Smith helps. But if we're gonna do this conservation BULs, it can't all be done by government agencies you know, we need private conservations really kicking in and preview has been a great example. The benefits, we if you buy land, you protect it from development. We can conserve species that need big home ranges such as elk, golden eagles, bighorn sheep, great public access for whether you're hiking, hunting. Um, Bob Smith told me that a lot of people are moving to the Wildcat or the Scotts Bluff area because from California, Colorado, he thinks a big part is because we have all these conservation lands in the area. Um, so in summary, what's it take to be effective in BUL conservation? Well, we need staff, biologists that are hardworking with passion and vision who know the natural history of their landscapes. We need, because we are so private lands, local community buy-in involvement. We need good science, like these group from Kansas University studying prairie in Northwest Nebraska. And we need money. We need funding. Uh, raw would be great. We need uh, a lot of other funding sources too. Thank you, Sarah and others. Thank you so much, Jerry. I think that last slide really kind of sent that message home, how we can make it, how we can make conservation effective. Um, we are next gonna switch over to Nicole Plectus and Sam Hartzell. So Jerry, if you wanna stop sharing your screen and we can have Nicole and Sarah bring up their screen. Um, they are, as I had said, the special projects administrator and the park planner for the city of Lincoln Parks and Recreation Department. So go ahead and take it away. All right, I think you're muted. We aren't hearing you yet. And again, if anyone has questions for Jerry or as Nicole and Sarah are talking, please feel free to type them into the chat. All right, are you able to hear us now, Sarah? Yes, sounds good. Okay, great, thank you. And you can see our PowerPoint slide. Okay. So, yes, we can. Okay, great, thank you so much. Well, um, I'm Nicole Flectus, and I'm um, an Iowa native, but I've lived in Lincoln for nearly 25 years now. Um, I grew up in the country where I really developed a love of outdoors. And since I've been with the city of Lincoln, I guess um, I should say my education, um, I have a master's in landscape architecture from the University of Illinois. And my focus there was really on kind of natural resources planning. So the bigger, bigger picture. And since I've been um, with the city of Lincoln now about 25 years, uh, I've worked in various capacities in different departments um, including leading some of the, the watershed management programs and then the comprehensive planning efforts and the last major update actually to the comprehensive plan, which we'll 
refer to, I think, a few times because that was also about a decade ago. Um, I've worked now with this department for about eight years, working on a variety of special projects, but those include work on uh, conservation and our greenways. Hi, I'm, I'm Sarah Hartzell. I am a Nebraska native and um, did spend my younger years traveling as a Navy child, but um, I've been back here for since I was about 12 years old. So I've always been kind of an outdoor girl. Um, we lived in the country as well and um, spent a lot of time outdoors. I have my training in um, secondary science and education. So I spent about 10 years um, as a teacher at, at Wilbur Claytonia High School in just south of Lincoln here. Um, spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to get kids to fall in love with science, um, even though they didn't necessarily want to become scientists. Uh, I did go back to, my, back to school myself in my 30s to get my master's degree, and I've been working in various capacities with mostly with the city of Lincoln since then. Um, and then Nicole and I both, as she said, came from the planning department before we came to the parks and recreation department. And about 10 years ago, we started working on the comp plan. And one of the big ideas that we had during that comp plan was this um, prairie corridor concept. And so the project evolved and, and moved over to the parks and recreation department and first Nicole, and then I moved along with it. So um, we're, we wanted to talk a little bit about decades of commitment to open space. Uh, the city of Lincoln and Lancaster County have um, included open space in their comprehensive planning since the 50s or 60s when they first started planning together. Um, you might know that Salt Creek, which is a tributary to the Lower Platte, um, kind of circles through the, the county. There we go. Let me see if I can get my pointer going here. You can see it reflected in some of these plans. This is Salt Creek, the very upper reaches down in the south end, and it, it curves up around the city of Lincoln. So Salt Creek has, has impacted everything from transportation and utilities planning to parks and recreation planning in the county. Not really too surprising then that it showed up prom has showed up prominently in plans um, for decades. Uh, in 2000, during the update of the comp plan, the green print challenge was developed and it identified core resource imperatives in the county, including freshwater and saline wetlands, wooded riparian corridors, and native tall grass prairie. Um, and you can see those reflected in the greenways and environmental resources in the current land use plan, which is the one in the center and in those green and dark green colors. And also in the, um, the Salt Valley Greenway and Connecting Corridors map, which is this one on the, on the right. Um, the Salt Valley Greenway is composed of not only the Salt Creek um, corridor, but also Stevens Creek. And then these corridors, these connecting corridors go to a lot of the state recreation areas and, and local um, NRD ponds and um, connect both the community and the habitat back to the city of Lincoln. So um, clearly here we're not talking about uh, a pristine, uh, large, uh, tall grass prairie, but we're, we're in a, we recognize we're in a urban rural interface. Um, and I, I think we believe that one of the strengths of this project is making connections both between the ur urban and rural, but also um, between some of our remnant prairies and the different habitats that we have within the corridor. <clears throat> I'm gonna just get my pointer set up here. So um, as Sarah said, the city county comprehensive plan that uh, we, we finalized about a decade ago, looked up to the year 2040, 30 years into the future. And in fact, interestingly, they're in the process now of developing the 2050 comprehensive plan. And so we're taking a look at progress that's been made and how we might adjust our uh, goals moving forward for, for that planning effort. Um, but um, one of the things that were captured in that 2040 plan, we're looking at what are some specific strategies we need to have in place in order to move forward on some of these big ideas that we've got. And those included developing a strategic or master plan for the Salt Valley Greenway and connecting corridors, 
um, developing the partnerships to move that forward, and then certainly funding sources were part of that. So this is looking at, uh, if you're not familiar with it, um, the city of Lincoln would be up and to the right off this map uh, shown on your left. This is Pioneers Park. We have a large area of prairie that's associated with the nature center uh, there. Conestoga Lake State Recreation Center is an, another destination in the corridor. And then Spring Creek Prairie Audubon Center at the south side. And there were a number of um, conservation easements also within the southern part of this corridor as well. When we, when we set out to kind of do a more detailed planning effort here, we engaged the Flat Water Group to help us develop a master plan. And as part of that effort, we went through this process of really overlaying all of the natural resource features that were in this landscape. And certainly, as you can see in the, in the tan color, a large part of that was grassland, looking at uh, virgin or native prairie remnants, pasture, but also native seeding areas. And then the 100-year floodplain that's shown here in blue, we have um, both freshwater and also some of Nebraska's uh, eastern saline wetlands in this corridor as well. Um, and so starting to kind of overlay all those different resources, woodlands within the corridor and seeing where they overlap, seeing where the most valuable resources were. And then the map on the right is what Sarah and I refer to kind of as this heat map where we overlaid on the on the x-axis sort of these these high areas of diversity valuable habitat with on the y-axis what were the most critical parcels for connectivity and then use that to help develop what was the priority area for um, for ultimately for the master plan and this i should say is not a static map we continue to update it as we get more information and the project progresses All right, so um, once we, we had the project area had kind of been defined, we had to decide what kind of project this was. Um, is it a trail project, a conservation project, an economic development project? And what we ended up doing is deciding, yes, it's all. And so we developed six project goals for this project. The first is um, a conservation goal. And when we talk conservation in the context of this project, we talk about actually preserving the properties. And so um, we're looking at ownership preservation or easement preservation. And it was um, determined very early on that this would all be done in a voluntary incentive based, based approach with any willing landowners. So we spend a lot of time contacting landowners and communicating about the project with them. Um, second pillar is the habitat restoration, and that's it, the process of either restoring or enhancing the natural, fu natural function of the land. Most of the focus has been on tall grass prairie, um, although riparian corridors and wetlands are certainly part of the project as well. Um, we use all high diversity local ecotype seed on all of our restoration and enhancement projects, and our focus has been on providing a diverse and resilient ecosystem to support pollinators, birds, and other animals. Um, education, oops, education and outreach are both very important to this project to get people engaged with the project and supporting it. Um, we engage with landowners and the community, including the village of Denton, as well as um, helping to evaluate tall grass prairie and the awareness of the locals and visitors. As many of you know, the bookends of the project area are the Pioneers Park Nature Center on the north and Salt or Spring Creek Prairie Audubon Center on the south. And those two premier um, education centers were really the reason that, that we started looking at this area for this project. We have about one minute left, Nicole and Sarah. Thanks. Um, research with the University of Nebraska Lincoln has been a big part of this project. We've had stream, soil, um, habitat and, and pollinator research completed on the project. Trail development, um, this trail will be passing a, through about 10 miles of corridor, but approximately 14 miles long. And we envision a, a trail with prairie on either side of the trail. And then economic development, and many of you have probably participated in some trail rides um, to smaller towns, but we feel like there's a real um, 
opportunity here for the village of Denton to develop a, a trail ride and just in general for ecotourism in the Lincoln area. Oops, I've done it. I didn't get this thing off. So just very briefly, this is where we were really at with the corridor when we began. You can see the priority area that's dashed outlined in purple and areas of conservation shown in tan, brown, or green. And then as we've advanced, that was about 4,500 acres at the start out of about a 7,800 acre total corridor. We've been able to conserve since the project started in about 2013. Now um, over a thousand acres, either through the purchase of land or easements. And you can see those acres in bold on the map where we've been able to, to achieve that through the purchase of land or easements. And then we've been able to complete about three miles of the trail and we're working, we've completed several trailheads as well that serve today to access larger conservation areas that we've been able to preserve, but eventually will connect up um, these areas of, of the trail as well. So looking in the future, we wanna continue to build our partnerships, which have been extremely valuable um, to the project. We're working to make sure that the 2050 update of the comprehensive plan is even, even stronger in its support of habitat and, and um, preservation of properties. Um, we're looking at different models for conservation and one of those being the possibility of a land trust through our Lincoln Parks Foundation that would be an independent and help us not only with this project, but others. And then we always try to remain flexible. We, um, we often have opportunities that are unexpected come up. Um, we've had some, some interesting stories over the years, but one of them that we like to tell is about a gentleman who at the beginning of the project was adamantly opposed to it and showed up and actively <laughs> uh, spoke against the project at many different public meetings. And um, we stayed in communication with him. We always answered his questions and you know, maintained a friendly um, relationship with him. And one day received a phone call from this gentleman who lived on 20 acres of, of what would be a, a real prime connection for us. And he was wanting to talk to us about selling his property. He had decided he wanted to move and wanted to sell. And we were able to work through a, a process with him to purchase a portion of his property. So just staying open and um, you know, being there when people wanna talk and, and not pushing um, for, you know, for easements or purchase unless that person was, was ready to move forward has been really valuable for us. All right, thank you so much. Um, loved all the connections you were able to pull together there in that project. Um, next up, we have Lindsay Rogers. So if Lindsay, if you want to get your PowerPoint shared, again, Lindsay Rogers is the Education Division Administrator here at Nebraska Game and Parks Connection, or <laughs> Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. All right, go for it, Lindsay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Lindsay Rogers, and um, I wasn't really planning on doing an introduction of myself, but I will real quick. Um, my name is Lindsay Rogers. I've been with the Game and Parks Commission for uh like 11 years i don't know 10 10 years 10 11 years something around there um i'm originally from omaha i was raised by um two individuals that um are fairly on nature related like they just like my mother has told me quote i get a headache if i'm outside too long so i'm not 100 percent sure how i ended up where i ended up but I really think it had to do with um, some experiences that I had in middle school and especially in high school um, that really involved me in a hands-on experiential way of getting outside and learning about nature down and dirty. I mean, when we talk about um, exploring wetlands, we were in the wetlands. We, we traveled up and down the Missouri River um, in one particular program for six weeks of the summer. And so it's those experiences that led me to be where I am. Uh, I went to the University of Nebraska Lincoln for an undergrad in, um, well, you know, I switched majors a couple of times, but I, I settled on environmental, um, environmental studies. 
And um, it's interesting because while I was doing that, um, I worked at a water quality lab. Um, I worked um, in Kyle Hoagland's water quality lab for years doing research and it was fascinating. But what I, what I got frustrated with is that this research was being published and putting in really great journals and then sitting on the shelf and nobody was taking the time to share this. So it ended up being that whenever the lab got asked to go do a public presentation or a, a festival or the groundwater festival or whatever, they sent me. And um, I very quickly learned that I, um, I love science as a, um, as a learning process. I, I'm fascinated by all aspects of science, um, which probably comes from my father who is a, um, was a high school physics teacher. So he instilled in me a love of science. And um, so that led me to think, well, gosh, I love science and I like sharing that passion with everybody else. And so um, I went on to get a master's in education and um, that has led me on the journey to where I am today. Um, today, we are gonna talk about 10 years of natural legacy education, which is comical because as I said, I've been at the Game and Park Commission for about 10 years. And so, um, you know, where were we when I started and where are we now is um, very much the same and very much different in that um, we are still passionate people. Um, we're still really passionate about sharing our love of nature and our love of wildlife and natural resources with everyone else. Um, but it's the way that we are going about doing it that is very different. So um, I always like to start out and talk about why is conservation education important? And um, many of you have probably heard me say this before, but conservation in, in my world is akin to a three-legged chair. We really need research. We need high quality, good data. We need good management. And that may be um, man land management or water management. It might be restoration projects. We need to manage the land in a way that it is good for um, all natural resources. And then we need education. And we need education for a number of reasons. One, we need support for the research and the management. And without education to the masses, we're not going to have that. And then the other reason that we need quality education is because um, without it, we're going to end up doing the same restoration projects over and over and over if we don't start learning why we're doing what we're doing and why we needed to do what we are doing. So really, the bottom line is, is that without all three of these things, we're going to fail. Um, and that's not saying research is more important than management or education is more important than any of these. They are equal on equal grounds and, and we really need all of them. Um, so where were we 10 years ago? And then we're gonna talk really quickly about what it, what's changed and why it's changed. And then where are we now? And then where are we gonna go in the future? So 10 years ago, when I first started here, we were doing a lot of one-time presentations and they were good presentations. I'm not gonna say that they weren't. We were going into classrooms, which right now in 2020 seems foreign to me of like going into a classroom, but um, we were going into classrooms and we were doing lots of library programs and one day workshops and festivals and, and what we started calling one offs like we'd go and we'd leave we'd be there for 20 minutes. We'd spread some knowledge and that's really important, but then we would leave and there wasn't this coordination and this big picture thinking of where is it that we want to go and how are we going to take these little steps to get up to that? So um, what has changed? We really moved um, from doing a ton of one-time presentations. And that's not to say that we don't do them. We still do them, but they're a significantly smaller portion of our time. So we moved from doing those one-times or those one-off presentations and programs to this really ongoing strategic education where we're looking um, to get people to expect things, to get um, the general public to um, want education and to be expecting education. And, and why did we do this? Well, the, the bottom line, quite honestly, is, is that we are a small team. Um, and before this year, when we came to um, have the Fish and Wildlife Education Division, um, when it came to doing um, ecological education, um, you know, Game and Parks Commission has a lot of education and certainly the state of Nebraska has a lot of phenomenal environmental educators. Um, but when in, in our agency, specifically looking at conservation or ecological education, we had um, two full-time people and two partner positions. We had four people to cover the state. So we were a small team. 
and Nebraska is a really big state. And so it became an, an issue of if we go to this classroom, that means that we're missing 500 other classrooms. And so we really wanted to start looking at how could we do things more strategically and reaching bigger audiences. Um, so where are we now? We're really trying to do more big picture initiatives and looking at how can we reach bigger audiences or how can we reach more people still having meaningful impacts because um, again, sometimes when you go big, you lose that meaningfulness or you lose that connection. But um, looking at better ways to coordinate and plan and implement more of that coordination. So um, some of the things that we are doing now um, or have started doing over the last 10 years um, is Nebraska Bird Month. So many of you have probably heard of Nebraska Bird Month. It started in 2015. It's now an annual met event. Um, it always takes place in May. And really what this boils down to is, is that there is International Migratory Bird Day, which is always celebrated the second Saturday of May. And up until 2015, Nebraska had nothing. We had no international migration. And that to me was just like, wait, what? We, we are the, the confluence, like we're the, they're, we're the bottle, we're the place that birds migrate. Why aren't we doing anything? And so we really um, got together with um, a number of different individuals, Dave Titterington, Andrea Foss, um, several of us got together and we said, well, it may not work to do it the second Saturday of May. What if we just did a month? Um, and it, it turned out really well. We asked any conservation organization that we could think of, if you wanna host an event, we'll provide resources for you. We'll provide pub, um, you know, advertising, we'll do all of those. Um, we'll pr provide you with kids booklets and pamphlets and sticker sheets and bird journals and all these kinds of things if you'll do the event. Because again, we were a small team and we didn't have the staff to be able to do 50 or 60 events across the state in one month, but we can help you do events. So that first year we had um, 58 events happening across the state, which was um, phenomenal. I was, I, was, I was aiming for 20. So I was really excited about that. And that continued year after year after year. Um, it's interesting, I will put in a plug for 2020. We instantly ran into a, well, we can't do personal in-person events. So what do we do? And we took it online and we turned it into, if you register and if you sign up um, and you go on iNaturalist and sign up, then you will send you a bird packet. And we had almost 500 people sign up in one month to do research. And we collected so many different iNaturalist and research grade observations on iNaturalist. We were really pleased with that. Um, following on the success of that, we've been working on Nebraska Pollinator Week. Um, this is in conjunction big time with Melissa and Sarah and the uh, Nebraska Natural Legacy team. Um, so we've done um, Nebraska Pollinator Week for the past two years, maybe three years. Um, and again, we turned it in 2020 to an online, um, an online event, um, but it is always celebrated the third week in June annually. We work with partners across the state and coordinate the effort, not necessarily always doing the effort. And I think that's important because like I said before, we have phenomenal environmental education. We have phenomenal um, organizations across the state, conservation organizations across the state that are all wanting and ready and willing to do stuff. And if we can coordinate that effort, we can get much broader and bigger things done. Yeah, um, 30 seconds, Lindsay. What, you didn't give me a two minute warning. I wasn't able to pop in. We have about 30 seconds. All right, fair. So we do our legacy um, in uh, education workshop or our lead workshop, and this is in every BUL, it's every year. Monarchs on a Mission was an opportunity to combine science and art awareness. Um, the biodiversity display project was a big initiative that was a couple years um, in the making. And then our biodiversity program. I think that the most important thing that I wanna get across is we're not done. We are just getting warmed up as far as what we wanna do. And, and the next big thing that we are looking at is ensuring all Nebraskans are educated about Nebraska's natural legacy. So expanding our outreach to some of our underserved audience, continuing to coordinate those efforts and growing expand education initiatives. What questions, any questions? All right, great. Um, I haven't seen any come in specifically. Um, okay. We will probably do a Q&A at the end. So we have two more presentations and then we'll have an open Q&A. Uh, Sounds great. We have Gerald Messel. Um, Gerald, if you wanna try to get your PowerPoint up that you want to share, 
Um, again, he is the retired Missouri River Program Manager for Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. So we'll hand it over to you. Are we good to go? Yep, PowerPoint is up, looks good. Okay. Uh, my bio, the only thing on here that's really important is I'm retired. I'm still a fisheries biologist and I'm still working on restoring the Missouri River. Quick background for all the new people we have here today on the Missouri River. It was channelized for navigation and dam for navigation, flood protection and hydropower. Because of those changes, we lost a tremendous amount, over a half a million acres of habitat, the natural hydrograph's been disrupted. What used to have, where we used to have a huge sediment load, that's gone. All that habitat supported a lot of fish and wildlife, that's gone. A lot of recreational opportunities disappeared at the same time. We've ended up with federal and state endangered species and, and fish and wildlife are continuing to, to decline ever since these changes were made. So where were we a decade ago? We had a great habitat restoration program. We had authorization from Congress to restore over 166,000 acres on the Missouri River. We're doing neat stuff like the, the new side channel at Hamburg and lower Hamburg. We were working in a lot of places, over 70 projects on the, on the landscape, diversity of habitat, side channels, backwaters, wetlands. Uh, one of the biggest ones was, was just trying to widen the river back out again after it was narrowed for channelization. In 2000, 2003, we had a, we had a, um, a, a biological opinion um, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, telling the Corps of Engineers the way they were operating the river was, was endangering least turn, piping plover, and pallet sturgeon. Huge influx of money and, and talent, um, engineers and biologists and planners. Uh, habitat restoration targeted at these three species. But what was really cool from our standpoint was this, this basin-wide monitoring program, which we've been looking for for, for years. So we, we were sampling across the basin using standard methods and, and approaches, and, and that you'll see where that's led. And then kind of finally, uh, prior to this last decade, in, in 2007, Congress off, authorized this huge basin-wide study to look on how to mitigate the habitat that we lost how to recover our federally listed species, and then how to restore the ecosystem to prevent further declines. In that same bill, um, they created a, a, basically a citizen advisory committee for the Missouri River Basin. What's really cool about um, that big study is if you compare it to the goals of the Natural Legacy Project, they're, they're nearly identical. And so we work in, you know, in, in along the same lines exactly as what would, was guidance from the legacy project. So a decade ago, we had experimental releases um, on the Missouri River. We had that big study going on, restoring tens and tens of thousands of acres of habitats, our big monitoring program. All that habitat restoration was leading to a lot of new recreational activities. So a decade ago, it looked like we were making some really good progress. So this last decade, uh, things haven't looked so good. Uh, we lost our experimental flow releases in a lawsuit. Uh, the Missouri Congressional Delegation defunded our basin-wide study. Uh, then Corps lawyers got involved and they decided that the Corps was really directed to work on endangered species. And so we lost the multi-species component of everything we were doing. So our monitoring program has really focused just on pallid sturgeon and the birds. Uh, our, our habitat restoration program went from this diverse, all kinds of habitats being restored to just some very specific habitats for pallid sturgeon and birds. And with the loss of the habitat program, new recreation opportunities are no longer appearing. Mr. Rick, which also came about as an advisory committee to help restoration has really turned out to be more of a hindrance than a help. Um, if you look at the membership, although we have some really good people working towards fish and wildlife recreation, we have just as many people try and make sure nothing changes on the river. So it, it, it's not been very positive. So the last decade, I think we've taken some steps back and, and it's been a little frustrating. 
but there has been some positive things going on. We've really started to see the results of our long-term monitoring. You really can't do much with a data point. You can't do much more with a couple data points, but after 20 years, you can really start doing some real interesting stuff. We have millions of fish have been collected and, and, and tens of millions of habitat um, data collections, and, and we're starting to use that. One thing we used it for in the last few years was the, the revision of the tier one and tier two species list for the legacy project. Uh, we came with a big list of fish to these meetings that we thought were in trouble. We, we didn't get our big list of fish on. We got some fish on and, and we upgraded some, we changed some. We had hoped to add sickle fin chub to the state endangered list. It sounds like that didn't go too well recently. Uh, we'll continue to work on this. Some of the neatest stuff we've done with those giant data sets is we've been able to describe habitat needs for a whole range of fish species. Um, here are two, two of our tier one species, the plains minnow and the flathead chub. You can see that the plains minnow spends their whole life in really shallow, slow water. Where the flathead chub, although they start their life in that same habitat, throughout their life, they use a whole range of, of habitats and, and, and end up in the deepest, fastest part of the river. Why did I highlight these two tier one species? Historically, um, these two species made up not over 90% of the small bodied fishes of the river. Today, they're very uncommon. So you can imagine the loss of food resources for predators such as pallid sturgeon in our system. This is another use of that, that, that same information. These are heat maps of depth and velocity use for a couple species. What's, what's amazing about these is these heat maps aren't made with a few dozen collections. These are anywhere from a thousand up to tens of thousands of collections go into making these heat maps. So we not only know where fish are, we know where fish aren't and they haven't been sampled. So we take these individual heat maps for 52 species of life, fish life stages, 52 different species and life stages, and we put it in a cluster analysis, subjectively crop that off, we've developed these habitat use guilds for the Missouri River. What's a practical application for those? We, 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 we've done this work at Deer Island, located near Takema in Eastern Nebraska. This is actually the site where Congressman Fortenberry was on the river when he announced the Recovery in America's Wildlife Act. So this is a site we took him to, spent the afternoon talking about things, and, and this is where he made the press release. But what you can see is we've greatly widened the river, created all this wonderful habitat diversity. Here's habitat availability for those, those different guilds of fish species. You can just see for a range of velocities from slow to fast, how much habitat we have available. Uh, very little for most of these guilds. After the site was, was modified, you can see the increase in habitat that we were able to show for this site. So we have this tool that we can communicate with engineers and politicians and biologists about what works and what doesn't work. Uh, you can see some things that aren't working great. We're under higher velocities. We don't have very much habitat, especially for this group of species on the left side that rely on sh slower, shallower water. Unfortunately, the engineers fixed this site a couple of years ago, and you can see that we've lost a lot of that habitat diversity. And so we have to go back to the Corps of Engineers and get this fixed. You got two minutes, Gerald. I'm in good shape. We're, we're taking steps forward. I, I think we're ahead of where we started. We got a lot of good programs going on. The longer we study, the more we know. The, the, the better we're gonna be arguing with the other constituents on the river. We have a really good research and monitoring program on pallid sturgeon. I wish it was multi-species, but it's not. And our, our habitat program still has 100,000 acres of authorization remaining. And there's a lot of people trying to get this program going again. We, we thought we were making really good progress, you know, the last 15, 20 years. Um, we thought we had everybody going in the same direction, but that's not really the case. Uh, we have a lot of partners on the river. Uh, that's a lot of what this session's about. I figure somewhere between 500 and 10,000 people are trying to help us. They all have their own agenda and it's been very difficult 
find it trying to make progress with, with 10,000 different agendas on the river. But I think we are. Um, people want you to give up um, sometimes in these conservation areas, but we're, we're, we're continually trying to move forward. That's my talk. Great. Thank you so much, Gerald. I appreciated the realistic view about how there's a lot of people involved in conservation. So thank you so much. Um, our last plenary presenter, we have TJ Walker. TJ, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Um, again, he is in the Wildlife Division. He's the Habitat Partners Section Administrative, oops, sorry, um, Habitat Partners Section Assistant Division Administrator at Nebraska Game and Parks. And we are hoping that TJ can kind of wrap it all up and he's gonna talk about some partnerships. All right, we can see it, but you are muted right now, TJ. Sorry. Okay. Try this again. All right, so thanks again. Uh, I'm TJ Walker. I'm an assistant division administrator of the Habitat Partner section with the Game and Parks Commission. And today I'm here to talk to you about the decade of connections related to the Nebraska Natural Legacy Project. I was born and raised in Oakland, Nebraska. Um, at the age of 12, I took a job as a pro shop attendant and then followed that up with assistant to the greenskeeper at a golf course. Um, I'll let you read the rest of these, but the point of this overall is I've been working um, for the public and with the public since I was 12. That's 34, almost 35 years. Um, I guess that's what I was meant to do. I didn't realize that when I took the job as an assistant uh, in the pro shop, but um, I do like working with the, with the people and for the people. And um, I'm also a family man, <clears throat> photo of my family here, uh, my wife, kids and grandkids and like to do hunting, fishing, bird watching, and other things outdoors with them. There have been some substantial changes since I started with the Wildlife Division in 2002. We used to get accused of managing too much for game species and that we didn't care about non-game species. People didn't really understand that's where our funding sources were at. Well, that's changed. Funding sources have changed, and we now have moved to a point where we are doing things in many cases for non-game species and now pointing out that they're helping game species. Truth be told, we have really moved from doing habitat management and at a relatively small scale to doing more ecosystem management and typically at larger scales. Also in more focused areas like the BULs, for example, which is providing benefits to many species that live in those ecosystems, both game and non-game. In addition, we have greatly expanded the boots on the ground area. As you see here in 2002, we had 12 total people in our section. Um, we were still working with partners obviously beyond that, but now we have 57 total team members in our section. That's substantial change. I could spend my whole time talking about these partners, um, several of whom are on here today, but some real highlights I want to touch on is the incorporation of legacy into the USDA conservation programs like EQIP. That was a big one, um, has produced a lot of successes, and also major involvement from, you know, federal partners like the Fish and Wildlife Service Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, um, Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever, Sandhills Task Force, Rainwater Basin Joint Venture, and many other partners, and leaving anybody off that's on here I mean, I, like I said, I could spend the whole time of my talk just listing the name of the partners and they're all appreciated. So why partnerships? We can all do things on our own, of course, but there are a lot of reasons to do things through partnerships. Bottom line is that we can be more efficient and effective and with greater impacts on the species and the ecosystems when working together. Just as an example, I want to kind of go through how partnerships uh, come together and how they how they can be more effective. In the Les Canyons BUL, I was working out in North Platte at the time when those things were kind of coming together. The landowners there figured out they had a problem with the cedar trees and with their rangeland conditions. And initially, TNC um, 
came into and came into the picture and started working with them and encouraged them to form the Les Canyons Rangeland Alliance, which they did. And that was a huge step and it's it was really the basis for the success out there. So as we started moving forward, we had NRCS, TNC, Coil Forever, Game and Parks, and the Les Canyons, uh, the LCRA, the Les Canyons Rangeland Alliance, all with somewhat different views of where things should go, um, different views of how they should go and who should be involved, things like that. And over time, we shifted that into a collective vision where we all came together, compromised here, compromised there, um, really brought that all into want more of a cohesive shared vision looking forward. It sounds like Gerald would like to have that on the Missouri River. <laughs> um, it's really been the, the basis for the success out there. Um, we've shifted from landowners that are afraid or landowners that were afraid of the Endangered Species Act to landowners that are proud to have American bearing beetles on their property. Um, we shifted from landowners that were considering suing their neighbors for having prescribed burns to now having conducted their second or third burn of their own. So those are huge changes. Um, most of that has happened because of partnerships. The last comment there on the multiple hats, um, different hats, different agencies are received differently by different landowners. So there is value in having the opportunity to have different people be the initial contacts. So why does Nebraska stand out when it comes to partnerships? Um, can't we all just get along in Nebraska nice or a couple great things here, but when I travel to regional meetings, I'm amazed at how different things are in some other states. Some states have strong effective partnerships, but others really don't. And they'll hear about our partnerships and they'll ask, how do you do that? And the only response I can usually come up with is how do you not? In Nebraska, we have these, it's just second nature to do these partnerships and it's, We've been become so effective in it that we we do literally everything through partnerships. And I'll also point out we have to because of our land ownership situation. So much of the state and private lands we have to be working cooperatively with partners and with the landowners. And I always point out to them the great people that we work with, including our own staff, partner staff, and of course the landowners. I know some don't appreciate sports references, but. When opposing fans leave our stadium saying that they were amazed how nice Husker fans were to them while they were there, that is us. That is Nebraska nice. That is who we are. So looking towards the future, excuse me, we've had some great conservation successes. Jerry covered some of those. Um, the canyons is another one. There's many, many more. But looking to the future and what could be coming down the road, especially if new and large funding sources like RAWA become a reality. I would, if we were in a typical conference at this point, I would probably ask for a showing of hands. How many of you feel like the Nebraska Natural Legacy Project is yours? I would follow that up with how many of you feel that you have been involved with the Nebraska Natural Legacy Project. This isn't our plan as in NGPC, Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. This is our plan. It is a statewide plan was put together with a variety of stakeholders and is intended to guide conservation efforts across the state. If you don't feel that you are a part of us, or if you want to get more involved, you should reach out to those that are involved now. Reach out to Sarah and Nicole at the city of Lincoln. If you're around Lincoln, reach out to Sarah and Melissa, reach out to myself, our district managers, our partners. The collective we is going to have to get a lot bigger if our funding sources continue to expand. Those of us that are currently involved are going to have to invite others in. We is going to have to include more partnerships, more landowner cooperatives, more trust. And we is going to have to include consumptive and non-consumptive groups working together for the same shared goal of more and better habitat. And that needs to include the science, great partnerships with UNL and others, the management, and the access for constituents to see, feel, learn, and enjoy nature. The constituents vary from the city of Lincoln folks that are looking for a trail, maybe some bird watching opportunities and viewing opportunities to other areas of the state where we're looking for hunting opportunities along with some of the non-consumptive uses. Uh, let's see. We're at about two minutes, TJ. All right, I'm almost done, so. Uh, will things always be perfect? No, and they haven't been yet anyway. 
Will we have failures? You bet we will. But we will learn from them and ideally move forward together towards more and bigger successes while always trying to achieve Nebraska nice and work together. I look forward to seeing where we can take the Nebraska Natural Legacy Project over the years to come. And there is my contact information. If anybody would like to reach out to me, uh, I would love to hear from you and we can move into the uh, Q&A session, Sarah. All right, wonderful, TJ. Thank you so much for really kind of driving home how we have done so many things successfully through our partnerships. Um, what I'm gonna do right now is spotlight our five uh, plenary people here. Um, and then we will hop into a Q&A. So um, we should be able to see a handful of folks. All right, so there are our plenary speakers. They will be up on screen. Um, if you guys have any questions for these plenary speakers, whether it be specific to one person or any broad questions, feel free to type those into the chat. Um, but we're gonna kick off with sort of a broad question just to all of our plenary presenters. Um, what have you learned in particular about long-term conservation? Has there been one key concept that is required for long-term large-scale conservation efforts? And anyone on our panel, feel free to speak up. Well, one thing I've talked about this, but I think is the connection of the biologist to the landscape. Uh, knowing the landowners, trusted like by the landowners and uh, it works best when our biologists are there for a long time. And if we're always changing biologists, I, I think it uh, is a little tougher. I'll agree with that. And I'll add, you know, utilization of sound science, finding ways to continue to cont contribute to that science. And, you know, also, um, you know, using, using information that we can gain through that science and, uh, you know, using that to help guide our management. And, you know, just always looking for capitalizing on opportunities funding wise. Um, I, I should have mentioned Nebraska Environmental Trust is one of the partners there. They've been huge, huge part of the success of, uh, of Legacy and that, that funding source is always an important part of that as well. And for us, I would say one, one big lesson is kind of the value of patience. I think Sarah alluded to that with her story. Um, we've had that experience now with actually multiple landowners and then trying to um, just really do the, the legwork to be well positioned, both in terms of funding and um, I guess the foundation for the project. So when an opportunity does arise, you're ready to, to take advantage of it at that time. Yeah, the, the message from the Missouri is that you're not always making progress. There, there's times where political climate or conditions to just set you back a little ways and you just have to be resilient. Um, keep gathering the data as, as TJ and, and Jerry said and, and build on that. Yeah, this is uh, Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Is that you, uh, Director Douglas? Oh, a couple of things. Uh, one is, you know, I think we've learned a lot about the, the importance of planning in large scale conservation. Um, you know, I have a favorite saying that if, if, if you don't have a plan, then somebody else has one for you. And, uh, but another thing is uh, communication and outreach as it regards uh, large scale conservation. And one thing in particular there is, is, as you look towards all the different people who care or might care about what you're doing, both positively or negatively, then uh, you need to plan to, to communicate and reach out to those, to those people and those interest groups. But realize that not all of them will uh, have the same timeline for accepting your message. So you may have to start <clears throat> earlier with, with some constituencies, because it's gonna take some time to build that trust uh, to build that uh, rapport, if you will, 
And in other cases, people are going to jump onto that bandwagon because it's more in line with what they think in the first place. So, so critical, critical planning and critical communication is really important to success. And Lindsay, you were the only one that didn't pipe in. Do you want to say that? Yeah, um, I think um, I would agree that um, making sure that we are communicating in an effective manner what we are doing to broad audiences is critically important. Um, not only um, because what we're doing is really awesome, but also because we need that support to be able to continue to do what we are doing. And then the other lesson um, that I think is critically important is that um, we can't do this alone. And so remembering that there are other conservation organizations across our state and our region and our nation that are ready to work together to get things done. But we also need landowners and we need um, urbanites and rural um, individuals. We need everyone to be participating in conservation to be able to get meaningful things done. All right, wonderful. Great to hear from you all. Um, another one, and we don't necessarily have to hear from everybody, but if you want to share plenary presenters, um, what was your first win that made you feel confident that you or the project you were a part of was going in the right direction or that you were doing the right thing? Well, I'll start out with, we've done a lot of work, Oak Woodland work at Indian Cave State Park. And we kind of always took the methods that we were seeing done farther east from like Missouri with our burning and thinning. But then people from the eastern part of the country kind of started wanting to come to Indian Cave. They had heard about it and wanted to see what we were doing. So we'd have these field tours with biologists from North Carolina showed up. So I thought, this is a change. Um, so I think it was when others were interested in what we were doing was a lesson for me. The same thing, uh, I don't know, let's see, 25 years ago, we opened up the side channel at Hamburg Bend, and, and that was the first restoration project on the Missouri River in Nebraska. I, I've, I've given tours of that site uh, for the last 25 years to, to thousands and thousands of people. Most of the staff at Game of Parks hopefully have had a chance to see it, but, but multiple conferences, I've taken trainings groups from the Corps of Engineers and the Nature Conservancy. And, and, and it, it, it just told me that we were probably on, on, on the right path, that, that what we were doing you know, was, was going in the right direction, just, just the interest that we got from across the country for, for people that got to see that site. I could, I could add a couple quickly. Um, one of them from back when we started the Lust Canyon stuff, we were running uh, American bearing beetle traps in the right of ways in the road ditches. And a landowner pulled up, stopped beside us and started complaining about us trapping next to his property and asked us to move the trap from the, from the location because he didn't want the American bearing beetles to be found there. And then I made the comment, well, because of the species, we have funding for cedar removal. And the landowner goes, what's that now? <laughs> And it just instantly changed the situation. Next thing we knew he was offering us to go up in his pasture off the road if we didn't want to sit by the dusty road, um, which we didn't do. We kept the trap there, but that really kind of turned the tide a little bit. Um, another one that I would say is when, I would say it was probably five, six years into the Nebraska Natural Legacy Project. Um, other states actually started contacting me as a district manager um, asking us how to pull together partnerships and things like that. And when you start hitting that national map, um, people from coast to coast contacting you, asking you advice on partnerships, that's a pretty good indicator that, you know, success is coming along. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, another question, and then we'll get to maybe a few coming into the chat. How has your effort increased access for different user groups or what is still needed to increase that connection to the resource for our different constituents? I can kind of jump in for the Prairie Corridor. I think, you know, it's obvious we had sort of a number of, of different 
um, user groups that we're reaching out to. And um, certainly I think the trail element to this project um, increases maybe the, I don't know if you wanna say the urgency or um, the, as we look at connectivity for the corridor, when you when you have a trail element, it's fantastic because it brings people out into the project and into the resource to appreciate it and understand it. But also the trail without that connectivity, um, you know, you, you don't have a way for people to really experience it in a continuous way. So that's adding another, I think, level of complexity for us moving forward and just even um, uh, with respect to getting around um, natural barriers um, and uh, doing so in a way that's gentle on the landscape, but also uh, barriers like the railroad and, and other jurisdictions that we have to work with. So that's probably one of one of our bigger challenges. Yeah. I can, from a um, standpoint, I can answer, you know, from a diverse audience, um, you know, for, for years, right about when I started, there was a new curriculum guide that came out called Growing Up Wild. And so um, we have been talking with early childhood educators for 10 years. And that sounds like a, like not your typical audience. Um, they, they don't know a lot of science to be brutally honest. They oftentimes are apprehensive to get outside. It sounds like not your low hanging fruit, not your easy audience, but actually, um, they know they need to get outside and they know they need to get kids outside. Um, they just aren't sure of how to do it all the time. And so it really became a fun audience to work with because their passion and their excitement is, is there and they're excited to do it. Um, they just needed a little help and a little bit of support to be able to do it. Um, and another big thing as far as reaching um, like you're not your typical audiences or new underserved audiences is um, a survey that we are working on putting out right now is to reach, um, you know, either racially diverse or um, sexual orientation diverse, or just reaching a broad audience and, and figuring out what different audiences want from conservation education, because um, we, we want them. We can't do this alone. We need everybody to be involved in this, but trying to figure out how we reach audiences the way different audiences want to be reached is, is the next on our, um, I guess, to-do list, if you will. Lindsay, um, what's, my, what's my favorite quote? You remember, Bob Adiam? Oh, right. Right, I can't, I'll paraphrase. In the end, people will help protect what they, you know, protect what they love. How's it go? Um, anyway, it basically says people have to be educated about what's, you know, the stuff around them before they'll love it. And then if they love it, they'll help conserve it. So, right. Um, First, we got to get them outside. We have to get this right. generation and all, um, all of our constituents outside just looking. Just yeah, to so appreciate the access it. component, whether it's, again, the city of Lincoln area trails, um, hunting access out in the Les Canyons or the Pine Ridge, you know, we have to get those opportunities out there for people to love these things and learn about them and love them and then help, you know, help educate them, uh, help vote, you know, in, in ways that will help get us to a point where these big funding sources can come through, um, things like that. Yeah. I think that, uh, it, you know, if you look back to the presentations of, of this morning, and, and think about the fact that, you know, it's a, it's a three-legged stool where the importance of education, management, and research is important. Where you, you look at the, the, the landscapes that are identified across the state, when you look at the vast partnerships that exist to move things forward, there's a place, there's a, there's a place where almost anyone can engage with the legacy project. You know, whether you're a landowner, and you're in need of assistance, whether you're an educator, whether you're a citizen who cares about the landscape or the wildlife, uh, whether you're another partner, whether you're a decision maker, for example, the Environmental Trust has used uh, BULs as a guideline for additional points sometimes. Uh, NRCS has uh, put forward additional dollars from time to time for activity in a BUL. There's just an invitation and a place in a culture for almost anyone to engage with the legacy project. With, as far as user groups, I'll use Indian Cave as an example. 
mushroom hunters and deer hunters, the woods were getting so thick with trees and so much down timber, it was kind of inhibiting their activities. And some of the neighbors who own woods mainly for deer hunting, or that's their primary recreation, were seeing what we we're doing. And they thought I should do this to improve my deer hunting and deer populations. So their motives might be different, but we're getting the same biodiversity benefits to birds, plants by them thinning and burning, which they are starting to do now. All right, wonderful. Um, so we did get one question in the chat that I think we can kind of make broad for everybody, but I am gonna read it off. Uh, Michael had asked, he said, I'm a brand new Nebraska master naturalist in Omaha with a desire to engage in habitat improvement. What's the best yeah. use of my resources? So perhaps we can have our plenary presenters maybe talk about what actions can people who are on this call right now, what can they do? Um, we have undergraduate yeah. students, landowners, master naturalists, biologists, managers, administrators, educators. We have a lot of different people on this call. So maybe are there a few things that we can either pointers to give to them about how they can make change in the state? Ooh, I'm on it. Go for it, Lindsay. Um, I think that um, if you were on this call, if you are on this conference today, you're passionate and that's all there is to it. You wouldn't join and sit in a conference um, for a couple hours um, if you weren't passionate about what you do. And the best thing you can do is share that passion period, end of story. Take anybody out. If you're passionate about deer hunting, go take somebody deer hunting. If you're passionate about mushroom hunting, take them mushroom hunting. If you are passionate about literally sitting outside, take somebody and sit outside. The, the best thing you can do is share that passion with somebody else. I'll add to that that, you know, any of you can, you know, contact our local game and parks offices or other partners in your area. You can find, uh, you know, you can search online to find conservation you know, efforts in your area. You know, the Omaha area, Fontenelle Forest is a good example and there's others, others going on there. Um, there's, there's opportunities where people can get involved um, directly in habitat management. Um, welcome aboard, Michael. The Ma Master, Nat Master Naturals program is great. Um, you know, we love having people join that and get, get involved. So the, the main thing is, you know, as I said in my presentation, just start reaching out and finding, finding out where we can fit, uh, what we can contribute, and, and then jump in. Yeah, I'd like to reiterate with what Lindsay said, that you're, you're, you're located in Omaha and the Missouri River is on your doorstep. We have a lot of habitat restoration projects and things like that going on out there. Um, the scale on the Missouri is a little different that it's mostly done by... <coughs> and stuff like that. We need that third leg of that stool, that education on the Missouri River. Get people out there, show them the river, explore the river, um, become familiar with it, um, lose their fear factor over it. Um, that, you know, so that's an example on the Missouri River. We're just getting people out and playing in the water, walking on the bank lines, things like that would be a huge contribution to our overall program. And I was going to say, we, we do a lot of work reaching out to Nebraska Master Naturalists for the Prairie Corridor Project. We just had a recent uh, prairie violet planting to help support the regal fritillary habitat uh, at Pioneers Park Nature Center. Um, there are just great opportunities all around and um, education outreach is an important one, but also just in, on the ground field work that we've, we've done is really helpful. The, Go for it, Jerry. Well, the last thing I'd say is, you know, donate money, donate to our wildlife conservation fund or your local conservation group. Um, a lot of opportunities. Buy a hunt license. Um, habitat stamps. All right, and as we are getting closer, it looks like we have about four minutes left of our plenary. Uh, we're going to ask our last question. It would be nice if we could hear from everybody, but um, our last one is going to be, what do you foresee as the greatest challenge coming up in the next decade? We were able to highlight a lot of successes and challenges in the past decade. So looking forward, what do you see as our challenge and maybe how do we try to help solve that? 
Well, I would I would say that our when you say our, I don't know whether you mean Nebraska or the nation, but uh, but I think either in either case, our greatest challenge in, in its simplest form is competition for space and water. Um, there's there's a growing population and there's a growing need for water resources. There's a a growing need for space and uh, trying to protect some of the last great places, trying to manage what's left and trying to manage water in a way that, that uh, recognizes the needs of uh, wildlife and ecosystem, uh, ecosystem services is, is probably, I think, in pretty broad, broadly stated, but that's what I see. As a botanist, I will answer that um, climate change is going to make invasive plants a lot worse, and I think it's going to become a bigger challenge. I worry somewhat about the directions of our universities not teaching enough natural history. Students know how to do <coughs> statistics, but a lot come out without the ability to identify plants, and I think our biologists need to be really good natural historians. One thing that I foresee is if we do get these big funding sources coming through and if we you know, have the opportunity to greatly expand uh, coordination and communication, you know, and all the trust and other things that go into partnerships at that point, I, I think those could be challenging. We're good at it in Nebraska, so I think we'll do well. But, uh, you know, anytime you add more cooks, the, the stew gets a little soured. Um, you know, that old saying, and there are opportunities there that, uh, could lead to some frustrations and could lead to some challenging times, but I, in, in Nebraska, we're doing well with partnerships, and I think it'll I think it'll work itself out. I'd, I'd like to just add on that that on the Missouri, we're challenged, like I, I, I pointed out, with so many partners. Uh, I, I truly believe the the, the, the long term solution on the Missouri River is, is to put the river back into the river channel. Uh, we have a lot of problems with flooding that it, it impacts the, the local landowners it impacts i-29 it, 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 it it's a huge problem I, I really believe we could put the river back in the channel really help with the flooding issue but but it would in the long run help with fish and wildlife and, and really provide this amazing resource that that jim referenced that 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 is in sur such short supply you know, in the eastern part of our state. So I, I really do think there's solutions that are win-win for a lot of these groups if we could just get them to the table and, and have these conversations. And, and as TJ said, you know, maybe compromise here and there, but 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 come to a common consensus on how we're gonna work forward to, you know, and, and solve these things. Real quick, I wanna add uh, that nationally and in Nebraska, you know, one of the one of the big one of the big notions out there is making sure that that as conservationists we remain relevant to this broad array of people, and so relevancy is uh, something that we have to all think about moving forward. How we how we be, how we remain relevant, but also how we communicate the relevancy of the natural system. And I think from our perspective, you know, being in the urban area, the growing urban area of Lincoln, looking out to the next 10 year uh, horizon for the new comprehensive plan, how can we both, you know, sort of integrate these natural areas and um, be respectful of them as the community grows, but also as we look to, you know, we're working on a climate resiliency plan, how can we help people understand that the natural environmental natural habitat is part of that and we have this interdependence where if we help protect those areas they will help to protect us so that those they're relevant even just from a strictly human perspective and i would have to agree with the relevancy um you know i think that we need to make sure that people understand what research and what land management we are doing and how it's relevant to them but also how just wildlife and nature is relevant to them and um, how do we engage them in this um in this place that we love because if they don't um i don't think that we're gonna get where we need to go so for example i don't think that if people don't appreciate and have this basic at just basic fundamental 
knowledge and appreciation for natural resources and wildlife and natural places, then we're going to have a heck of a time getting any farther along down the road of conservation and um, and natural resources protection. All right, that was wonderful. Um, I think hopefully we were able to provide a lot of different ideas to those folks in the audience. Uh, you were able to find kind of where you fit into the legacy project, uh, make some different connections, learn about a handful of these different projects that have really been quite successful or that we've learned a lot about in the last few years. Um, I'm just going to say thank you so much for joining in on the plenary today. Um, I will pass it finally back to Melissa Pinella if she just has any final last words. Um, but I will say we're just going to wrap up here and we're eager to see any and all of you in the rest of the sessions this week. So Melissa, do you have any final words? Again, I just want to echo the thanks to everyone who joined in this morning for the plenary discussion. Um, we heard some very great presentations and I'm looking forward to the rest of the week and hearing from the rest of our presenters. So please join in as many sessions as you can fit into your schedule. All right, and with that, I am going to end this meeting. Thank you all so much and we'll see you throughout the rest of the week. Thank you.